this is work with Matt Goodorf and Han Liang, but I will only talk about uh, Han Liang work. And I will introduce a very simple model of what I believe uh, chaotic field theory should look like. And I view it as the simplest model of spatiotemporal turbulence. Uh, as motivation, I'll just have one motivation slide. We do work on real partial differential equations, Kuramoto, Shevashinsky, but uh, on fluids, we haven't been able to do much work there. But here is the idea. When you look at simulation experimental data of uh, turbulence in a pipe, uh, if you take little snapshots of the pipe, finite little boxes, they look rather similar. And actually, we have a theory of what happens in small boxes. We have been quite good in doing this for the last 20 years or so. But we have never been able to describe an infinite pipe. And I think that's because we've been doing it wrong all along. And uh, I will suggest how we are supposed to do it in the future. So the idea is to build a chaotic field theory from simple chaotic turbulent blocks using time invariance and space invariance of the defining equations. I will follow Mephisto. I'll be of Mephisto for today. Most of the things I have to tell you, you haven't seen before. So I'll tell them to you three times. It's pedagogical dictum. First time, I'll give you a very brief course on chaos using the simplest example of chaos, which is coin toss or so-called Bernoulli map. So what happens in this model of deterministic chaos, you have a very simple dynamics in which your initial conditions of your dynamical systems are on your unit interval. And that unit interval in every discrete time iteration gets stretched by, in this case, by factor of two. And as you want to keep it within the unit interval, you take a modulo one and you get a two branch map. There is a left and right branch map. And you can show that every possible trajectory can either be specified as a sequence of real number x and, uh, or as a sequence of uh, lefts and rights or zeros and ones, symbolic dynamics. And then when we teach a course in chaos, we show how you organize all possible sequences in deterministic chaos. There's nothing probabilistic about this. And you enumerate all possible futures. Uh, and uh, that's what we usually do. Now, what's modulo one? You know, there's a stretching parameter S. And uh, this is larger than, it's an integer two or larger in today's talk. And what we do is we subtract the integer part. So we get an integer out of it. So that remainder always, this fields phi are almost in the interval zero to one. And M now is used to describe which kind of solution you have that's called symbolic dynamics. And it has an alphabet. For example, if slope is six, you are not throwing a coin, but you're throwing a dice. So there are six possibility. You know, uh, Bernoulli models is by slope six and you get six different intervals for M and they can be labeled by integers. So what's chaos? positive Lyapunov, which means the slope of this map is larger than one, so all neighboring points stretch as you go forward in time. And you want to have positive Lyapunov rate per iteration. Now, integers are, uh, iterations are here integers. So just looking at log of s, this is the rate per iteration. And uh, at every step, you have six possibilities of what you'll do in the future. Log of that number is called entropy. So deterministic chaos is positive Lyapunov and positive entropy. And in that sense, dice throw is a, is a deterministic chaos. And I'll show you how to do this for field theory by the end of this talk. The way I'll do this is I will recast the problem as a lattice problem. So instead of looking at my state now and computing state in the future, 
I'll define a temporal lattice. So T is now a label of a lattice site, and we remember that it was called time, but that's not essential at all. So on the left-hand side, I compare two lattice sites, and on the right-hand side, I have this integer, which is forcing me, it'll be a source in field theory, which is forcing me to choose one of the poss possible alternatives. And uh, if I take any finite block on this lattice, I can write it as a vector of n field states on real numbers with zero, one, and m integers, which are instructions which way I'm supposed to go. And the way you think about Bernoulli land in temporal lattice is that in one direction we have integers uh, which are the instants at which we are looking at the system if we decide to call this time. Now at each instant there is a field that's a, this function which is function which you can see it uh, drawn on in the beginning which are stretching parts uh, of the map. And then you have a number of valleys, you know, green is my valley here, but it could be blue or orange or red. So these are symbols, you can color code them or you can give them integer numbers or whatever you want. And they tell you where you are in which valley at a given instant. And then uh, at the next instant, you will be someplace else. And that's by these symbolic dynamics integers specified. So that's what Bernoulli land is. And I'll come back to it at the end because we use this picture to actually compute solutions uh, of desired uh, symbolic uh, dynamics itinerary, uh, even when it's not as simple as the model I'll show you today. So now you can write this on any finite interval as an, a vector of states on the lattice multiplied by identity minus uh, the preceding guy, that's a shift matrix. And that has to uh, obey the commands from the command and control center called M, the sources. And this is now a matrix equation. This is a vector, this is a matrix. And this matrix is a shift matrix. It just compares what happened one step before or after. And you want the law of nature to be time invariant. So there's a unique choice for the boundary condition for shift matrix, it has to be periodic. Otherwise, uh, you have uh, destroyed time invariance. So that's how it looks like. And now uh, you're solving the following problem. You have instructions what to do, that is M's. I have to follow a certain sequence of uh, valley visitations. And that has to uh, satisfy a law which says, take this thing and multiply it by something which will turn out to be orbit Jacobians, I call it J. And I solve this problem using the Feynman equation. Feynman equation is you take any equation whatsoever, you put all the terms on the left-hand side and make it equal to zero. So I do that and I have to find zeros. And now what's happened? Uh, to solve this, I need the global lattice state. Now lattice state is uh, in hypercube because in every time step, uh, it has to be within a unit interval. So there is a hypercube. And I have to find a point in this hypercube that satisfies this equation for a given M. And that's a single fixed point. So what has happened is to solve lattice problems, you solve them globally by looking for fixed points in the unit hypercube in this particular model, rather than, you know, going daga, 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 daga in time. So time, we have forgotten it. It's just a label, but uh, you can call it anything. Now, if this is a nonlinear equation, which is usually what we have to do. The way we would solve it is we would uh, have to take a derivative, but now it's derivative on the whole orbit. So it's called orbit Jacobian matrix. So it's a large matrix. And then we would use that to improve, let's say, our Newton guess or whatever method you are using to compute solutions of this problem. Now come two things that you're probably not familiar with from personal experience. One is really fun. It's called fundamental fact. 
And the second one is the interpretation of what it means to perturb a global solution. So here's the fundamental fact. To solve this equation, m's are integers. This is a real number. This matrix is full of integers. So I have to take a real number, I have to multiply it by a matrix full of integers, and I have to get an integer because otherwise this will not add up to zero. So what does this do? You know, it takes unit hypercube and stretches it like matrices always do. And that has a name in uh, lattice literature, which is infinite, it turns out, because everybody has to do this stuff. It's called fundamental parallel pipette. So you get some deformed shape. And that's what this product does. It takes any point in a unit cube and puts it in the parallel pipette. And then you have to look at points, integer points now, you know, which will, when you add this instruction set, give you zero. Uh, so you have to translate everything to the origin. That means that the number of integer points within the fundamental parallel pipet is the total number of solutions. You know, how many possible solutions I have that satisfy my law of nature, because not every sequence of M's is admissible allowed. And uh, this volume of parallel pipet, uh, it has a name. I name it Hill's, Hill determinant because it's custom to name everything uh, by dead old white men from last century, even though they have nothing to do with it. But you'll see hell determinant is actually, hell determinant is actually an important variation of this. And the number of solutions of, in Bernoulli land is just determinant of this lattice. Now, picture is better than many words, so let's do it for, period two lattice. Period two lattice means I have only two field values and they repeat themselves as I go down. So my matrix is only two dimensional. Unit hypercube by uh, unit vectors. The matrix stretches them and they just become columns on this vector. If you draw the picture, what it does is it's two, so it's matrix square. This square gets deformed into this. This point goes there, that point goes there. And you look at it and realize this is a sum of three quadrilaterals, each one of them of area one. And the fixed points are these three little circles. One of them is the fixed point repeated. The other one is a two cycle of the original map. So this is how fundamental fact counts solutions and that'll be crucial for us. In three dimensions, you can still draw it and you can turn it on in a computer screen. So there is a three dimensional cube and you show that there is a bunch of points in this volume, which are on the integer lattice of the map into this thing. Second, so first was fundamental fact. Second, what does Jacobian orbit mean? When we were evolving our chaotic system, we had a notion of temporal stability because we had this idea that every time we step, the neighbors separate. So I have to compute Jacobian matrix and look at its eigenvalues. And that eventually gives you things called, by another dead white man who didn't do it, Yapunov, gives you these numbers which uh, specify chaos. But now we don't have time, we're just on a lattice. We only have this global perturbation of all things being perturbed a little bit. And then there's this amazing formula which you probably have used without realizing that it's called Hill's remarkable formula that says, the, the determinant of this huge matrix, because J could be, you know, a thousand points on periodic lattice, it can be very big, equals determinant of small matrix. This is, let's say, two by two matrix that advances your little system forward in time. And this is an identity, and it was so puzzling that, uh, you know, he'll just use it. He was a gentleman uh, working you know, he left Yale because he didn't want to deal with students, you know, so he was working from his home and he did Fourier transfer, etc. But Poincaré had to prove it. So there is, it's called Hill Poincaré because the left-hand side in the limit of continuous trajectory is a functional determinant, kind that we always see in quantum field theory, and the right-hand side is something totally simple. So, 
why does it count periodic points, this you know, stupid thing? We saw one way, which is this parallelogram, but there is another way which understand dynamical system. This is short course on dynamics. In 84, Azara de Almeida announced principle of uniformity for chaotic systems. And it says, if you have chaotic system, it has a state space. And it's ergodic means, you know, you can get every place. And they said, well, within it, there are unstable repulsive periodic points and they kind of uniformly cover it. So uh, if they're correctly weighted and the weight uh, turns out to be determinant of one minus Jacobian inverse, and that is correct. And today in reputable books, this is written as a flow conservation sum rule, it says, if you take the state space and put points where the periodic points are, then this tells you the area, one over this determined tells you area of your neighborhood. When you add them up, you have to fill up everything and you get one. So Hill says this thing is a global determinant. So the flow conservation sum rule says that one over Hill's determinant is the how periodic point on this orbit, how much it weights. In general, that depends on periodic points, but for this system, expansion is uniform, same every place, so determinant doesn't depend on where you are. And you find out that number of fixed points, all of them is equal weights, so number of fixed points over determinant j equals one. So that's how this determinant counts solutions. Now, what does this have to do with periodic orbits and stupid determinant? Well, there is a famous formula that says logarithm of determinants trace of logarithm, first invented, I believe, by Newton, which says that uh, if I take any matrix, it's true for any matrix and also uh, operators of matrix class, uh, if I uh, put any matrix, for example, one minus uh, matrix that describes one step forward in time, then the determinant should be exponent, taking exponent on both sides, of this thing expanded, you know, logarithm expanded Zn over n, and t to the n, I take a trace. Now, what's a trace of, uh, of a matrix? It's periodic walk uh, on the points of the matrix. So that's how you connect these determinants, orbit determinants, to uh, periodic walks. And this has a name. Uh, it's always called zeta function. In this case, it's called topological because it counts. It doesn't weigh uh, in a particular way. And this one over n is reflection that we have cyclic invariance. If I have a solution, I can rotate it and it's still a solution. So I have to count it only once. And that's called a prime orbit. So a zeta function is very smart. It counts orbits, not individual states. And um, the problem is now solved because you stick your formula for periodic orbits and it turns out it's simple rational polynomials. So nice zeta functions are rational polynomials of which you'll see several. And it has an interpretation, it doesn't matter. But once you've gotten to a zeta function of the dynamical system, you've solved the problem because you can count all states, you can compute all expectation values of any observables. And this is periodic orbit theory. The course is finished. If you don't know, you'll have to click on the link here on the online thing. And uh, what did I tell you? First time, when you think globally, you have to act locally in the following sense. Each solution is a one pattern in your state space which satisfies a fixed point condition. So the space of the hyper, you know, unit hypercube is really the space of periodic solutions. And uh, it's a global space. It has a global stability. And there is a fundamental fact. Uh, the Hill determinant of that counts the orbits. And if you're smart, you'll write zeta function and you'll be done. Now you say, I'm a physicist. I don't care about these introductory courses in math departments or chaos, who cares? I want physics, I want Hamiltonians, I'm Thomas Prozen, I want everything to be quantum mechanics. Okay, okay. 
Bernoulli, too simple for you. Let's do a mechanical system, totally legal. We'll take a mechanical rotor. Second time I sing this song. Uh, define now in one space time something that's called cat, but I'll call it one dimensional spatial temporal cat. It's always taught in Hamiltonian formulation, meaning forward in time, but uh, Lagrangian formulation, field theorists know that, which is the whole action, is much more elegant. I'll skip the Hamiltonian, but basically it comes from physics in the sense that if you look at atoms on which you shine laser light, you can imagine that Rydberg atom runs on a circle and laser light is a bunch of pulses. And you write nice discrete uh, map. You know, the first one says difference in time per unit time is called momentum. Second one says difference in momentum per unit time is called impulse or force or whatever you want to call it. In other words, this is just usual Hamiltonian system just discretized. And you can now show beautiful pictures for different Fs, for example, circle maps. But I will take the simplest example. You know, simplest example of force comes from hook. I just, I push and the force responds linearly. If I do that, this now becomes a linear map. And I noticed that if K is larger than you know, some number, uh, I start running outside of the unit interval for momentum. That's a good subject, it's called diffusion and ionization, etc. But we'll follow the, the philosophy of Bernoulli map. When I get too high, I take modulo one. So that's why this modulo one is. And now if K is integer, you can show that it takes thing defined on a torus because before it was on a circle map now it's on two circle maps and uh, for integer it's continuous it's automorphism map stores in the torus and it's on the torus so it's called cat so that's a cat map but if you write it in lagrangian we always learn about harmonic oscillators the life of a physicist is nothing but redoing harmonic oscillator in more and more complicated way said sydney coleman if this stretching factor is feeble, I don't stretch very widely, then hook rules. I push my system and it's a spring mattress, it'll oscillate around the resting state. So that's what we usually do. But here we go to the other extreme, which is very simple. Turns out if S is larger than two, so the generalization of slope of Bernoulli map is higher than two then everybody runs away. So what used to be sines and cosines are now hyperbolic cinches and cautions. And cat is to chaos what harmonic oscillator is to order. So you really have to learn your cat map if you want to understand mechanical uh, version of chaos. There is nothing more okay. fundamental. This is a sister to but wild system. So you do this, you write it in Lagrangian formulation and you find out that the way it works is that now the equation says, I'm here at time lattice side T. I have to know what happened before and I have to pay attention what happened uh, second time. This is because I had two first order linear equations. So when I put them together in a second order equation, I'm computing second order derivatives and second order derivative on lattice compared to three points. And in the middle, this stretching, you know, maps me possibly outside of unit interval. So I have to follow the control center and put an integer here to make sure that everybody is within the unit hypercube. So this was noticed by Percival and Vivaldi in 87, but nobody made much out of it. So this particular equation, we do it just like we did it for Bernoulli. We write it as a matrix on every finite set, acting on the state following the orders from the matrix, the M center matrix rules. Uh, and where now, 
this thing uh, has nice symmetric form. That comes from the fact that uh, mechanics is time reversible in the system. So the, this Jacobian matrix has to have symmetry and the time going to inverse time. You solve it like before. The matrix is a little bit different. You look for the solutions. You find global lattice fixed points and they have to sit in a hypercube. And if you draw the simplest example for period two, the unit square gets stretched into this thing, fundamental parallel pipette, which can be covered by five uh, uh, unit area quadrilateral, this, this, they all have unit area. And indeed, fundamental fact is counting number of the solutions. Then you do the ultimate thing. You compute the generic function of all possible uh, solutions. That's called the zeta function. And uh, you stick it into a definition of topological zeta function. You evaluate it, and you get a beautiful, explicit ratio of polynomials, which you can understand in many deep ways. But it's just a polynomial. So this is answer to everything having to do with a single cat, a modern cat by the single cat. So, we sing it again, but before that, you know, what do we have? We two step, have two step equation. What is that two step difference? That's called a Laplacian. You know, I compare three points, but I'm stretching not by factor of two like in Laplacian. Laplacian takes my two neighbors, adds them up and compares it to twice myself and computes local curvature. That's what Laplacian does. But this one stretches a little bit differently, so I subtract these two equations. And I get an equation saying Laplacian minus mass square for physicists in uh, quantum field theories acting on my state, quantum in this case classical, uh, is a solution of the equation which is called, in this case, Dan Poisson, but it's a version of Helholm's equation which says if I have charges, integers, uh, you know, in the place, there is one field that solves it. Now, did you realize that, you know, cat map, which is an ugly, you know, stupid thing with cat being sliced, Thomas will show you <laughs> the horrible thing doing to a cat in his talk. It's so cool. It's just Helmholtz equation. It's the simplest possible thing you can have. You know, in continuum, that's what Helmholtz equation looks like. But we are in a situation where mass is imaginary. We have a wrong sign. And that's totally reputable. That's called Poisson, screen Poisson, Yukawa, Klein, Gordon, whatever you like it to be. So there couldn't be a simplest equation. And in one space time, we have solved it. We are done. So second song is finished. What do you do? We look for fixed points, we computed orbit Jacobian matrix, we use fundamental fact to find all the solutions, and we put them together in a beautiful zeta function done. Now comes the pièce de résistance, that's why I'm here. And how did we do it for spatiotemporal cat? Meaning, I am a cat, to the left and to the right of me there is a cat. And because of translation invariant space, there's an infinite array of cats to my left and right. But in the future, there is a cat, maybe not myself, because some other cat might step into my valley. And in the past, there was a cat. So I have a two-dimensional array of cats. And, uh, you know, you can do it Hamiltonian way. Boris Goodkin, who is hiding out there, did it. It's, it's tough, uh, but they like it when they do quantum mechanics. Lagrangian formulation is beautiful. And what do you do in Lagrangian formulation? It says, you know, I'm a cat, I couple to my neighbors. I want it to be invariant, the spatial translation because there is no spatial point. So I'm on infinite spatial extent. I want it to be invariant in time. I want to follow the same law so that it's infinite in time. So now we have gone from little systems of n three bodies interacting to infinitely many, but uh, we'll use invariances. And now Boris does another assumption, says, well, usually when you write this couple math lattices, then I couple to my neighbors with some strength. 
and I couple to my past and future with some strength. And usually, for some mathematical reasons, one wants to couple weakly to other cats. But you know, strongly care about my identity as a cat's a strongly couple in the vertical direction. But let's say that this, you know, I just scaling, let's make the strength the same in future and inside. And you find out that now you have a square lattice, which uh, is invariant translationally in two direction, and it has symmetry flips, and you know, it has actually four symmetry flips. And you get a beautiful five point uh, relation that says, I'm here, I have to look who's left, right, who is up and down, you know, and I have to follow the command and control center. So, um, you know, K assumption was invariance under space time exchange, and uh, lots of models which prove rigorously existence of this and that uh, are eliminated because they depend on recouplings. And we have ended up a special temporal cat being Euclidean field theory, discretized, where you know the Laplacian in two dimensions compares left right neighbors, top front, and subtract two in both directions. So there's number four. This equation has stretching factor. I subtract them. I get a d-dimensional equation, which says Laplacian minus m squared, let's say, is uh, of my field is, depends on what charges I have, and that's the problem I'm solving. So it's perfect. If s is smaller than two, that's called Helmholtz and everything just wiggles around, oscillate. If s is larger than two, things are falling or exploding off exponentially. So only thing you have to remember from this whole talk, Traditionally, Coleman's students had to look, they had to jump on the spring matters. So they say, you know, the ground state of quantum field theory before I put interactions, there are lots of springs, harmonic oscillators, da, 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 da. That's a Helmholtz in this case. But if I have chaotic field theory, then on every side, I actually have a rotor. So what happens here is children jump up and down, and you know, they stay in a place, they jump on the bed. But in chaotic field theory, the cat gets into this, but this gives way because everything you push it, it just goes away. So everything is unstable, and all these cats are running around on the ground, you know, where all the rolling balls are rolling, nothing is put, you know, you're unstable every place. And that's what you want when you discuss simplest model of chaos and turbulence. Now, I have to put question mark, you'll see we can solve it because it's Helmholtz and uh, analytically, and we can figure out what the alphabet is. And to illustrate the results from now on, I'll be just in two dimensions. That's enough to understand everything. So now you have to solve an equation where fields are on an array uh, because on spatial temporal array, and uh, you bang this, so this is, you know, if you wish tensor two indices, you bang it by stability matrix, which is, you know, two indices, two indices. And this stability matrix is just a generalization of the, of uh, Laplacian. Instead of having two here, you have S here. Same song. What are the fixed points in the unit cube? because field is scalar, it just takes one value between zero and one. And you solve it like you solved it before, we solve it on finite pieces and make them larger, and eventually count all of them to infinity. But now you have to do it on the things that have period in space and in time. Time is vertical in all these pictures. And how do you think about it? You know, always, you think globally, so we took a field theory, but we put it on a lattice. So, you know, it's discrete here and there because we either put it on a computer or in this particular case, the cuts come in integers, so it's natural that it's a lattice. At every lattice site, specified by two indices, those are coordinates. They used to be called X and Y, and they're now called N and T. 
there is a value of the field. So globally, I'm trying to find a solution which every place locally on its tangent bulge, you know, on a transfer space, satisfy the equation, you know, Feynman equation, bunch of things is zero. What is this? You know, this is just all the derivatives in space-time direction that have to be satisfied. So I'm solving this problem that globally I find solution which obeys, you know, good cat behavior every place. I'm nice to neighboring cats according to the law which is, you know, whatever. In this particular case, the law is just the one that I showed you. Now, there is a funky thing about this which started in 19th century. It's very active today in cryptography, for example. Condensed matter physicists don't do it for some reason, but uh, even though there are lattices, but, you know, lots of people, thousands of them have to worry about it. It turns out when you have a lattice, uh, which is dimension two or higher, you can cover it, you can tile it by tiles with vertices on that lattice. You know, these are called tiling. And each this tiling produces a new lattice called sub-lattice, which is tiling the space by my vertex. And I'm supposed to solve my equation of any one of these guys. And you know, it's tricky. Uh, there is a fundamental result that says, Every two-dimensional lattice, which is distinct from lattices, can be uh, defined by a uh, parallelopiped two vectors this way, these two vectors of this form. So it has periodicity in time, periodicity in space, and it's in general slanted. That's called tilings are relative periodic. You have boundary conditions where you do your thing and then you shift and you do it again. That's a consequence of translation invariance in space time. You always get relative periodic solutions when you have that situation. So you have to count all these guys. It's not actually so hard. And now you have to understand one thing that's confusing to everybody. There is lattices,ation so you discretize any field theory. And what it does, it replaces the d variables of the d coordinates by d integers, which tell you what digitized coordinate is every dimension. So that's what these indices are, they're coordinates. Now in this particular game, we decided that all the fields are confined to one. That produces a Z1 lattice. So every time you get outside of the lattice by multiplying by the Jacobian matrix, you have to translate back into it. So, you know, there are two lattices going on, please don't confuse them. The old trick still works, but I can't draw the pictures. So old trick was if I had a hypercube, I just specified its edges, and then I multiply by Jacobian matrix, and the result is a fundamental parallel pipet whose edges are the columns of the orbit Jacobian matrix. For example, if I live on a three by two tile, with uh, no shift as I continue tiling the space. I only have to specify six fields on the tile and then uh, symbolic dynamics, which is here in colors. So color is an integer. Tiles, for example, entire space by copies of it. So for example, this is the tile and these are six copies of it, the tiling the space. And then you can solve this problem by stacking, you know, like, we always do, you stack these guys into one vector, you stack these guys into one vector, the command, and then the Jacobian matrix becomes a block matrix, which acts, uh, the little blocks act in one dimension, etc. cetera. Uh, the block matrix has, uh, you know, can be written as ve column vectors. You compute its Hill determinant, you can do it, no problem, and you get an answer for any stretching. So, you know, stretching could be any half integer in this case. And that's the answer for counting. And we can do it for all finite uh, parallel pipettes or uh, fundamental parallel pipettes of larger and larger space-time area. And we are trying to describe infinite space-time. So we are using periodic solutions to get better and better approximations, just like we did in temporal chaos. 
And, you know, some simple examples of tiling, they all look like that if you use color-coded uh, instruction set. So in Feinstein, that's what things look like. And, uh, you know, you can write them and there are lots of them. And uh, so we can count all of them. And there's something called prime orbits, which is too subtle for this talk. And now we should stick it in zeta function because that's what we do to solve the problem. And, you know, for a year or two, I can't do it, but somebody in the audience can do this because, you know, it's been done by Jacobi or Dedekin and it's elliptic zeta functions or something. You figure it out and tell me the answer. You know, I have some guesses, like here is a guess what rational polynomial has to look like. There are two directions, so there are two variables. I have to count how many time, how many space. And this is almost certainly wrong, says uh, Han Liang, my you know, collaborator. So it's funky, this part is not solved, but we are not alone. So I have roughly speaking 2,000 references to this because everybody <laughs> has to live on integer lattice sooner or later. So, you know, discretized Helmholtz in engineering, uh, Green's function, Gaussian models, Hartree-Frog, circulant tensor system, Ising models, lattice field theory, von Black determinant. You know, everybody has done this under some name or other. They didn't realize it was called field determinant, but it just goes on and on and on. And none of them has written the zeta function. So we're in a good company, but please help me. So, I generalized, you know, lattice. I went from time evolution to global enumeration of solutions of these problems on lattices. But is this chaos? Now, what's chaos? The idea of chaos is ergodicity, meaning that if I take some typical trajectory at infinite space time, so some typical pattern, there should be smaller patterns that come arbitrarily close to it because in ergodicity, everybody has to get shadow, has solutions which are close by. And uh, what it means is, you know, good can do it first, but what it means is you take a finite tile, large tile, and, and see whether it compares. So here is an example, you know, here is a state of a lattice, uh, the instruction set, the matrix M. Here is another one because it differs. But within the square in here, they have identical instruction set. So if I'm sitting here and I look at my past and future, I can't tell the difference between these two lattices, uh, you know, solution state space until I get to the edge. So what we do is, you know, we solve both and we compare the fields by taking logarithm of their distance. And what do you know? They're exponentially close, you know, this thing says it. So we do have chaos in the sense that now it used to be periodic orbit shadowed longer periodic orbit, but now we have shown tori shadow tori. And now I'm approaching, you know, a sad part. It actually happened in Santa Barbara four years ago, but I will ritually do it for you. There are good news, you know. So how do we think of turbulence now? Don't think of it by evolution of initial state. That's impossible because everything is exponentially unstable and very soon you lose everything. So you just can't do this. And this has blocked our research in Navier Stokes for many years. We've been able to work on small space-time solutions, periodic and space-time, but never on the large ones. Instead, enumerate possible solutions and compute each one. Now, I'll show you it's easy to compute them. Second, how do I give a name? And it's like a grid of New York City now. You know, I used to say one dimensional, I have to wander around through the sequence of areas and I have an itinerary in symbolic dynamics and that's how I name my solution. That was good for small neighborhood evolving in time, saying, you know, these guys are in this configuration, this, and I give them all names and I wander through that space. When you are in an infinite city like Chicago, well, this is half infinite city, but uh, 
then you need a grid and you need two coordinates and they have symbolic names they are 300 820 cross you know 6010 block and stuff like that so that's uh, what we learn about symbolic dynamics it has to be the same dimension as the problem itself for every continuous third uh, it used to be that we could show that chaos can be supported on periodic orbits. There was this uniformity principle, and that's how we were able to describe what happens at infinite time by hierarchy of solutions computed for finite time, but present there for infinite time because they're periodic, so they always stay there. Now, for every continuous dimension, I need another uh, periodicity. So answers are all in tori, like two tori or d tori. So periodic orbit generalized. Now you can ask, how can I compute this? This is, you know, lots of stuff. Well, it turns out it's very easy. So command and control center sends me a sequence. It says, you know, be in a gray valley, jump into the blue valley, jump into the red valley, and um, go back to the blue valley, state of two, etc. you know. So that's a typical thing. What do I do? I make my guesses and I put a field here, a field there, a field there, a field there. And then I connect them by rubber string. Now this rubber string has to satisfy the law of motion, the local law. And I tighten it up. For these linear models, it was trivial. I could do this just by matrix multiplications. When I do this for Navier Stokes to Kuramoto, Shiva Shingi, or Young Mills, or whatever continuous field theory I have to do, you know, I'll have to do some numerical descent method saying I have to keep the topology of the answer. And this is very robust, you know, that from experience. Not only that, but this is the only way we have ever been solving problems in chaos. When we actually solve and we do this, we specify temporary and we anneal to this centenary by tightening the rubber spring. So it's computable. In a process, nothing explodes. There's no exponential instability. It's the dullest engineering optimization problem. You know, it just falls into the answer if answer exists. So dynamics, it was nice by dynamics. You know, it's just a bad formulation of both chaos and turbulence. It's it just so stupid, but I'm sorry we all got tenure on it, so never mind. So there is no more time. You know, time has no privileged position in this. Every time I have continuous symmetry, they're just as good as time. They're all equally good. Time is dead. We killed it uh, close to the Fifth Avenue. It's the end of time and goodbye. And it's painful because we invested decades to get integrators forward in time for Navier Stokes and for exploding hydrogen bombs or stellar supernovas. And we always knew that was wrong. That's what we did. Every time they simulated the explosion of what they call supernova, but maybe hydrogen bomb, they got a different answer, you know, looking totally different. It's a wrong way to do this. You have to enumerate possible kinds of explosions, and that's the only way to do it. At this point, the stage is set. I have my trust for friends who love cats, like John Keating got his tenure on this. Marcus Saraceno loves cats. And what do I know? Thomas Prozen maybe also loves cats. So now I've set you classical theory, just quantize it, because you know how to quantize it for a cat map. You know, that's been done often enough. And that's it, I'm done. And I will share my lecture whiteboard from now on. And please don't kill any cats. I'm looking more at the practical side of things. So I, yeah, but know, this is totally we, practical. Cryptography. When we talk about computability of these things, so obviously we, we, you know, we solve PDs and we do something and we get some solutions, which you say is nonsense. The question is, if we try to enumerate possible states, like you're saying, uh, it's nice when that zeta function can be expressed in a nice analytic way, but if you if you're doing working with something messy, how many of these states? You know, if there are infinitely many and they're all qualitatively different, stational Break problem. In. We know how to do this in time evolution because when we teach these courses, we show them Rosler, 
and we showed them Lorentz map and everybody has two ears and all that. And uh, we realized that for certain kinds of uh, time evolution, we can count the visitations. You know, there's a clear separation, especially for Lorentz, there is a knife edge and you either go around the Z axis or you don't. So, you know, uh, symbolic dynamics is absolutely clear. He already wrote it in his paper correctly because student of Birkhoff knew how to do the right thing. So we know that some cases we can do this and on all other cases we have approximate symbolic dynamics which we improve by going further in time. And you know, we have to worry about non city domains uh, and stuff. And it's going to be like this in all directions. I think the answer will be the following. This is my practical approach to this. These problems are ridiculously posed because we want to solve for all possible patterns for all space and times perfectly to all digits, infinitely many digits. Now, in real life, there's always noise. The model is slightly wrong. You know, the truck was on the road, something happened. So there's some noise. And that says that small details get wiped out. And as you do find bigger and bigger tiles, you get to the tiles that you cannot resolve any further because of the noise. So that's how I believe in practice one does it. You know, you take a problem, it's a PhD in nonlinear science. Every problem, no matter how trivial it looks like, turns out to be a PhD because you have to develop techniques to solve it. There is no program you can press and it solves your problems. And it stops. Noise is your friend. So that's part of our research, how the noise you know, blocks finer resolution in space-time. So you resolve the space-time by uniformity principle, but it has fuzzy edges every border. The moment the regions get to be size of the border, you're done. You can't do anything. That's how I think about it. In you know, in quantum mechanics, it's called H bar. So it's not noise, but it's quantum mechanics. So I expect it to be the same. You mentioned applications to turbulence. What about the fact that turbulence is time irreversible? Does that affect the approach? This brings us to the new world. Now I can go to seminars every place. So on Wednesday, I was at Rutgers. Today I'm in New York. And Galavotti gave a beautiful talk. Galavotti is the old school and you know, he thinks seriously. And uh, he works on two dimensional Navier Stokes. And he works uh, in a large Reynolds or small viscosity regime. So he can simulate things Euler like or viscous like, and they're surprisingly similar. There's some beautiful things having to do with pairings of exponents in the, this viscous case where, you know, unstable directions plus stable direction exponent add up to the same mean viscosity number. So uh, it might work. Now I've been, you know, our group has worked on Kuramoto Shivashinsky. Lots of people have done this by covariant Lipuno vector analysis. And there the inertial manifold where all the action happened is totally different from the transient modes. So very uh, contracting modes in these problems uh, in this is totally different than what happens on a strange attractor where solutions run around and because of this non hyperbolicity sometimes they jump in other directions and you know they tie the whole attractor there. So it looks like Navier Stokes at least in the limit close to you know Eulerian limit uh, the time reversible version is a very good description of time irreversible version. They're very close. In Galavotti's work, I'm totally impressed by it. I recommend. If you uh, look at the, this seminar, hopefully Radger saved it, uh, it's really beautiful. And, you know, it addresses the question you asked. In, in ordinary field theory, one of the observables we compute are two point functions, right, of the field for free field theories, and that's a starting point for the discussion. Uh, in, in this effective field theory that I, I think you were talking about, are you also computing some two-point functions? And are they two-point functions of what? Or... You know, they're computable and the way we think of them, again, you know, we haven't done it in spatial temporal case, but we do it all the time in a temporal evolution. The way this really works is that, um, 
the dynamics is described by Perron, Frobenius, Ruel, or Koopman operators, which move densities around or move observables around and you average over that. These are linear operators, just like unitary evolution in quantum mechanics, they have spectrum. The leading eigenvalue for the bounds system can be shown, the eigen exponent is zero, and the correlations are controlled by the second exponent. You know, there is a gap and then there is a second exponent in these problems. So this is the way, you know, people in chaos tend to look at two point correlations. They say that there is a leading ground state, it's called natural measure. There are other measures, they're allowed, but they all decay. And uh, the rate of decay or correlation between t the two measures uh, is exponential. So I hope- You can think of that as a one that helps. thermalization rate, right? You can think of that as a kind of thermalization rate how, how the yeah approach. you can because it goes at exponential rate so you know you can think of chaotic dynamics as thermalization we don't but uh, in field theory it might be useful right to think about it but your 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 field theory does it describe properties of that uh, let's call it thermalized state some yeah uh, you know what happens in this a lot is coupled models is that depending on the interaction law they can have very rich structure. So there's a whole subject, a couple map lattices, synchronization, all kinds of things, which depending on these things goes through various phases. There are frozen things, there are things that spread, etc. We are in the extreme limit. So one extreme limit is harmonic oscillator. Everybody is just oscillating. We are in anti-harmonic limit saying everybody's hyperbolic in a nice uniform way. So this is like the most thermalized state by construction. Now you should think of these states uh, in discretized space-time like you think of Ising model. You know, every configuration of the Ising model is one of these patterns I'm showing to you. And you can solve this you know, by taking finite periodic or skew periodic things and taking limits. So this is some ways of solving Isimov. So we have taken, you know, evolution in time and turbulence and we have put it into statistical mechanics where there is a finite number of pattern. The number grows exponentially with the area of the pattern. But, you know, for every finite area, there's finite number of patterns and we can enumerate all of them. and depending on the law, some of them are allowed, some of them are, that's called admissible, some of them are not. So, you know, so that's how you think of doing statistical mechanics. You're averaging over all patterns and for each pattern, you have to compute your observable on that pattern. And that's called periodic orbit theory, zeta function, that's what it does. And because uh, there's this exponential uh, shadowing, small periodic patterns already give you very good answers and the further ones give you exponentially small corrections and that's called curvatures because you know compare shadow patterns to longer patterns and you find out having a finite set gives you very good description if uh, yeah if you know how to do it <laughs> could i ask a related question so if um if you had some field theory like lambda phi to the fourth substandard interacting field theory, what um, could you apply this method at least partially? To you know, that's my hope. You know, the thing that changes, the thing that made this problem so easy is that we made it nonlinear only in the instruction set in these sources, M's, but everything else is linear algebra. And, you know, linear algebra problems we can solve very well, even though they're not trivial because this, you know, prime lattices, sub lattices or lattices are not necessarily trivial problem, but, you know, we can do it. Now, the problems we really want to solve don't have fields that go from zero to one. You know, dynamics in Kuramoto, Shivashinsky, they tend to go, you know, from minus two to plus two, roughly speaking. And, you know, we say if you have some thing that's, you know, strong here, we'll give it that name and strong there, but it's much flop, floppier. So phi to the four would be, you know, probably the first thing you want to do because this is describing 
what's called a Gaussian model. This is describing only the quadratic part of the theory, but you want to put interactions in. And uh, I do not know what the answer is, but I would definitely uh, think you want to go in that direction and understand how the interactions come in, uh, you know. And in, in your model, what's a, so you said you can compute everything. What's a physical observable you would want to compute? Like, would you compute it? Yeah, you know, typical physical observables, uh, you know, they call energy, so, or enstrophy. So energy means that you take your fields, you square them, and you find out, you know, what's the variance of the field because it's ranging from zero to one. There is a thing that people like to do in fluid dynamics called enstrophy. So you take a derivative of the field and you square it. In other words, you're using a metric phi Laplacian phi rather than phi phi. You know. So people usually in physical settings like fluid dynamics compute enstrophy. Uh, and uh, in that, those cases, it turns out that enstrophy is related to dissipation, how you burn stuff that's controlled by enstrophy. And the uh, energy is put in in the modes themselves. So the input energy tends to be related to phi squares. What you get out is called uh, gradient phi square. Uh, Galavotti is very good on this discussion in his talk. And steady turbulent state is a average balance between putting energy into your dissipative system and burning it by uh, looking at Laplace and Laplace and penalizes, you know, kinky solution. They burn out first. So that's the balance. And then in fluid dynamics, you look at evolution of those things. And in these patterns, you might want to compute them for every pattern and find out which are dominant for your average, stuff like that. So th this would be physical things if fluid dynamics is any guide. And I haven't put uh, I over H bar into this. I'm waiting for Thomas to do it. Or Marcos or John, <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> I can comment a little bit about correlators. So if there was a question about correlators. Yes, please do. So the, uh, the comment is, so if you look at the correlators in such models, so they are so uh, these are very special models in the sense that uh, your space is uh, completely equivalent to time. So they're completely symmetric about the space-time interchange. And so for such models, both in uh, quantum and classically, so you have a very special property of correlators. So they are non-trivial only along the diagonal. So then your space coordinates is equal to time coordinate. Otherwise, so Thomas Brosen those that were better than anybody. So uh, otherwise, these correlators, uh, so at least between local operators, so they they vanish. So, but along the diagonal, so they are typically non-trivial and they do decay exponentially. But uh, so another comment maybe about perturbation. So in our original work, we actually look at the perturbation and think uh, stable. So you can add uh, your phi force potential without destroying too much symbolic dynamics. So you, you it, it is stable, yeah? So you can use the same symbolic dynamics also for a perturbed coupled cat maps. S sufficiently weak and for sufficiently, sufficiently smaller weak, range. Yeah. There are some bounds, so there are some mathematical bounds. I don't know yeah. to what extent it's rigorous, so they are proven for a single cat. Yeah, for I'm single sure, cat, I'm not so sure what, what is the rigors, what is the status of this rigor for uh, for this infinite dimensional lattices? But uh, as far as you have this finite lattice, so they are stable. Yeah, so this is just mathematical result. And uh, numerically, they do stable. So if you and you know, this you answers the previous question about structural stability for the small, you know, fields. The torus is still structurally stable we believe yes. at least in one dimension that's proven and uh, probably can be proven in space time as well yeah yeah but we looked numerically for this problem so they are stable. i guess if 
by phi to the fourth, I meant not adding phi to the fourth to the cat map, but just having removing the cat part. So just having the field theory with the um, equations of motion box phi equals lambda phi cubed. I think the real, the real problem here is to go from uh, discrete setting to continuous one. So this may be much more challenging. Well, I, I, I have a problem with this particular model because, you know, that used to be done, it used to be called XY potential. So one replaced, uh, you know, X squared plus Y, well, momentum one, momentum two squared, one half plus potential, which was uh, X times Y squared. So if you take one derivative, it's kind of cubic. And for a long time, people believed that this is an example of fully ergodic system. So if you didn't have X squares, but you just had a cross term X, uh, particular form of, uh, you know, quartic potential, until we killed it, you know, because uh, my friends uh, used our methods of pruning fronts to find out that there is a periodic orbit of length 13 in some symbolic dynamics whose immediate elliptic basin of attraction was 10 to the minus 11. So no computer would ever find it unless you understood the symbolic dynamics and systematically explored the solution. Now in this system, the moment there is an elliptic region, it's not ergodic, you've killed it. So nobody talks about X, Y as an example of ergodic smooth potential, but it's a little bit in the spirit of what you say. Uh, I would be uh, afraid of only having five, four without five squares. So our, you know, Boris strategy is to add weak uh, higher order correction to quadratic correction that follows tradition in ergodic theory, where what happens to one dimensional cat map on torus, all stable, unstable manifolds still intersect each other. They're still transversal, so they're structurally stable, but uh, they're not straight lines anymore. They're slightly curved because they're slightly nonlinear because there's some cosines and sines floating around. So that would be our strategy. The other one seems too bold to me, but maybe it's good. I haven't thought about it at all. So I got confused. I, mean, I thought in your action, your coefficient of phi squared is negative. So it's like you have uh, the mass, it's like you have a tachyon. Because if you just make it positive, then you just have a free theory. So that's why I assume the simplest thing is you take a free theory like phi squared plus, so positive, so the Lagrangian is d phi squared plus m squared phi squared, where m squared is positive, not negative like you have. And then you add the simplest possible interaction, which is phi cubed or phi to the fourth. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I, let's say I haven't thought about it seriously enough. I mean, it's someplace in the back of my mind, but we never looked at it seriously. In usual field theory, you imagine you have a, harmonic potential at every site. Now we have turned it upside down because we have gone imaginary. So every site is unstable. It has anti-harmonic potential. So you replaced running on a circle by hyperbolas because now, uh, you know, this thing has two eigenvectors, one uh, expanding, one contracting, and all the neighbors go. Now, usually, you give up at that point because the thing explodes, what are you gonna do with it? But it's wrapped up on a torus. That's why that module one shows up. So locally, everybody runs away. All the cats are just running, you know, in all direction as possible, but they come back because they're all on Tora. So globally, they come back. So that's, you know, the trick that makes this model work. Uh, continuum limit is not obvious, right? But as a discrete model, that's what it does. Now, justification is to say I've boxed my turbulent world in such a way that in every box I have instability, things are crazy, and I just represent them in the simplest possible way, and they interact with their neighbors. So, you know, that's how you could imagine you could get it, you know, justify this kind of model. In the many body theory, you say I have bodies and they have their dynamics, but they interact 
with the neighbors on other lattice sites. So their lattice is literally lattice of n bodies evolving in time. That's how the model originally came. 